Hello there, my fellow peacocks, and welcome to a brand new mini-series about one of the traitor Primarchs. Once again, your overwhelming votes this time have spoken, and I will be covering your favorite narcissistic Primarch, aka Fulgrim of the Emperor's Children. However, I'm not exactly sure if you knew, but he wasn't always an asshole. Once upon a time, he was actually a pretty nice guy, who wanted the best for the Legion and the Imperium. And that is exactly what we're gonna be talking about today. His homeworld of Chemos, his youth on this poor planet, and how he rose to lead it and turn it into a much nicer place. I will also be covering the arrival of the Emperor, the meeting between the two, and how he took charge of his Legion. Lastly, before I get started, I feel I should let you know I made a small change to the schedule of my Primarchs videos. While previously I put the videos randomly in the first half of each month, I have decided to make it a regular weekly thing, and I will be uploading, hopefully, every Tuesday. I am your host, the Grim Dark Narrator, and without further ado, let us learn a couple of things about the early days of Fulgrim, shall we? Fulgrim, also known in the time before the Horus Heresy as the Phoenician, is the Primarch of the Emperor's Children Traitor Legion. He possessed silvery white hair and was quite vainglorious, as his entire life was dedicated to the pursuit of perfection in all things physical, mental, and spiritual. Like all the Primarchs, Fulgrim was teleported away from Terra while still an infant via a warp rift through the machinations of the Chaos Gods. Though one couldn't guess the minds of the Dark Gods, it is believed they were trying to prevent the coming of the Age of the Imperium, or at least corrupted to that point where the spread of the Emperor's order would not weaken their power or threaten their existence. After being snatched from the Emperor of Mankind's gene laboratories deep beneath the Himalayan mountains on Terra, Fulgrim's gestation capsule came to rest on the resource-poor mining world known as Chemos. Chemos was a bleak and unforgiving planet, warmed by a small binary star and surrounded by a thick nebula dust cloud. The result was a world which was a place forever shrouded in perpetual twilight. Chemos had been settled by humanity during the Dark Age of Technology as a mining world, but it was isolated from its neighbors by the great warp storms that marked the Age of Strife. The problem was that the resources of the planet were running out, and its people were not producing enough food for their own needs. Eventually, it fell to a group of fortress factories to produce all the needed resources for Chemos. The entirety of the Chemosian people had to work every hour of every day, maintaining the vapor mines and synthesizers. Recreation, art, and leisure were sacrificed in the name of survival. Chemos was dependent upon interstellar commerce for the provisions of food, but the world was buffeted by warp storms, which made it very difficult for traders to reach the planet. Thus, the Chemosians were condemned to a slow death, despite their attempts to impose strict food rationing or improvise other solutions for providing nutrients. Scouts from the fortress factory of Kallax's branch of planetary police force, known as the Caretakers, discovered the Primarch's gestation capsule after it plummeted to the surface of Chemos. In the center of the crater, surrounded by the white-hot remains of a stasis capsule, was a child, barely more than a baby. Orphans were normally put to death on Chemos. The executive spared no resources to look after those who were unable to return their investment by working in the factory fortresses. But the captain of the Kallax scouts looked into the eyes of the child and saw something more than human. In defiance of tradition, the captain of the scouts appealed to the executive. Because of his value to Kallax, the captain was allowed to adopt the infant as a son. He named his adopted child after an old legend, long since discarded by the people of Chemos, the mythical god of creation known as Fulgrim. 
The child named after this legend soon created a new one, one that would become known to all the people of his world. Fulgrim grew unnaturally fast, becoming a strong and capable man. At half the age of his fellow workers, he was able to fulfill his obligations to the executive, working for days and days without rest. Not only was he physically proficient, he quickly grew to understand the technology of the machines he worked with, and began to contemplate their improvement. By the 15th anniversary of his fall from the sky, Fulgrim had risen from the ranks of the workers first becoming an engineer, then one of the executives themselves. Learning of the slow deterioration in Kallax and the other settlements of Chemos, Fulgrim set himself the task of saving the world, and changing it from a dying ex-mining planet into a center of art and wealth. One by one, he convinced his fellow members of the executive board to fight against the entropy that was destroying Chemos. Under Fulgrim's leadership, teams of engineers traveled far from the factory fortresses, reclaiming and repopulating long-dead outposts, mining centers, and fortresses in the planet's most inaccessible regions. The ancient mines were reopened and expanded, bringing more and more minerals into Kallax and allowing the construction of more sophisticated machines. This industrial efficiency soon grew to the point that Chemos' mines were once again producing surpluses for the first time in decades, allowing the world to begin to purchase food and other materials in large quantities from passing interstellar traders. Seeing the emergence of prosperity for his people, Fulgrim took pride in fostering the re-emergence of art and culture reclaiming the spirit of humanity that had been sacrificed so long ago in the struggle for survival. Terraforming technology was reinvented, allowing forests, oceans, and plains to spread from the reclaimed outposts and bring life back to the planet. As Kallax grew, the other settlements began to ally themselves with Fulgrim and help him rebuild and repopulate the long-abandoned cities of the planet. Using materials mined out of the reopened mines, ancient buildings were patched up and reconstructed, even as towers and skyscrapers rose above the ground. Fifty standard years after falling from the sky, Fulgrim rose to sole rulership of Chemos. As beautiful forests were planted on ground once mined for metals, and wondrous cities of glass, gold, crystal, and steel rose to new heights of glory, Fulgrim's presence drove a resurgence of craft, art, and intellectual refinement. Through dint of his intellect and achievements, he halted the backsliding of this hardscrabble world and set it upon a new path, if not to greatness, then at least the betterment of its lot. Metropolises built over rocky plains and forests grew on stony ground. This impulse to strive for something better would allow the people of Chemos to attain something akin to great heights. The changing of Chemos into a world of beauty and culture inspired Fulgrim to grasp ever more greatness. Not long after this great triumph, the world's isolation came to an end. From the perpetually twilit sky emerged a flight of Stormbird dropships heavily armored and battle-scarred, and bearing the Imperial Aquila, the badge of the Emperor of Mankind. When he learned of the Aquila, Fulgrim found his memory stirred. Chemos had no real military forces, but the Stormbird's landing zone had been surrounded by the Caretakers, the planetary police force of the Fortress Factories. Fulgrim ordered the Caretakers to welcome the strangers and take them to meet with him. In his private quarters, Fulgrim met with the heavily armored warriors from the stars, men who represented a true civilization that possessed all the culture and refinement that Fulgrim longed to return to his home world. From among the Astartes stepped the shining figure of the Emperor of Mankind. With one look upon him, Fulgrim said nothing, but simply dropped to his knees and offered his father his sword in service. Fulgrim swore from that moment onward to serve the Emperor and the needs of the Imperium with all his heart and soul. 
The emperor taught his son of Terra and of the great crusade he had initiated to reunite all the scattered worlds of mankind beneath a single rule. This was so that humanity would no longer face possible extinction at the hands of the galaxy's hostile forces and could claim its rightful place as the dominant intelligent species of the Milky Way galaxy. Imperial records do not indicate the exact date of the meeting between the Emperor and Fulgrim. All that is known is that Fulgrim's vast flagship, the battle barge known as the Pride of the Emperor, was completed by the Adeptus Mechanicus of Mars 160 years before the start of the Horus Heresy. Traveling to Terra to meet his new legion, Fulgrim learned that an accident had destroyed the majority of the gene seed designated for his legion, and without their Primarch, replacing it was a slow and laborious process. Fulgrim came to address the only 200 space marines of his legion, and the words he spoke were said to inspire the Emperor so much that he named the legion the Emperor's Children and allow them to bear the sign of the Aquila on their power armor, the double-headed eagle that was the Emperor's personal symbol. Fulgrim became driven by this notion that the Legion should strive to live up to this honor and the perfection of the Emperor and his vision for Imperial culture. This drive to achieve perfection soon applied to all things about the Primarch and the Legion from military tactics to the embrace of artistic culture that didn't exist on Chemos to their very appearance. Fulgrim was a particularly imposing sight, with shimmering, white, shoulder-length hair, large, friendly-seeming eyes, and a mouth that was never far away from a smile. His armor was of the finest quality and intricately decorated. Over it, he often wore one of a variety of high-colored cloaks. Fulgrim was anxious to make his contribution to the Great Crusade, but the comparatively small size of his legion meant that the Emperor's children were placed under the command of Horus and his Luna Wolves. Horus and Fulgrim soon grew close to one another while pacifying the Eastern Fringe. Eventually, swelled by recruits from both Terra and Chemos, Fulgrim was soon able to lead a crusade of his own bringing many worlds into the light of the Imperium. Fulgrim sought perfection and spectacle in these campaigns, as demonstrated when he took the world of Byzus with only seven men, despite nearly dying in the process. I will not be going into the details concerning his early friendship with Ferris Manus, because I've already covered that in my Ferris Manus The Great Crusade video. Fulgrim also established a close friendship with his brother Ferris Manus, who also attempted to purge imperfection from himself. Fulgrim and Ferris eventually came to each other trying to build the perfect weapon, resulting in Fulgrim creating Forgebreaker and Ferris Fireblade. The two exchanged weapons and they became synonymous with their respective Primarchs thereafter. And that, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about this early period of Fulgrim's life. In the next episode, I will be talking about his role in the Great Crusade, the beginnings of his fall from grace and corruption. What are your thoughts on the early days of this Primarch? Let me know in the comments below. Was this video entertaining or informative? In that case, please click the like button and subscribe for more content. Thank you very much for watching, and I wish you all a peaceful day. The Emperor Protects